we are recording. All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone that has jumped in this evening for our um, in Zionsville Invasive Neighbors talk. My name is Mindy Murdoch. I'm the Director of Recreation Services with the Zionsville Parks and Recreation. And I'm actually very excited about having this webinar because I was talking to Mary um, this time last year. We were actually planning on having Mary join us at the Zion Nature Center to give a very similar talk about invasive species in Boone County and in Zionsville um, and really um, how they impact our community and also sharing information on what Zionsville Parks does um, for the community as far as with our invasive species. So I'm glad that although we still can't be in person, uh, we are able to actually finally have Mary joining us um, to provide that wonderful talk. Um, so just really quick for those that are logging in person, if you didn't hear me the first time round, there is a survey, if you're welcome to, to answer it, it's, it should be in the chat. If you have any problems with that one, um, just let me know. Uh, this is also being recorded and I will share that recording with everybody um, after I, I get it back from Zoom. And we will also be posting it on the Town of Zionsville's uh, YouTube page and we'll be sharing it through the Zionsville Parks and Recreation Facebook. Um, so again, if you, you know, enjoyed this one, feel free to share that video to friends and family and others that you think would be important to know. Um, as far as the discussion tonight, majority of it is going to be run by Mary, which is fine. And at the end, I will, um, you know, I've got some things to talk about with the parks. And then, of course, we will make sure there's plenty of time for questions. Uh, but the nice thing with Zoom is that, you know, you don't have to wait till the end. If you truly do have a question, there is the chat function that you're welcome to type. Just make sure that you type it to panelists and attendees so we all can see it. And there's also the question and answer um, function. So while Mary is talking, I will kind of keep a watch of both of those. And if it's a question I can answer, I will do that right away. If it's something that um, needs to wait towards the end, I'll try to make note of it and we'll, we'll touch base on that towards the end of that one. But I'm going to turn it over to Mary, let her introduce herself and let her get started talking about invasive species. Hi everybody, let me get my screen up one moment. I'm really thankful to have uh, this opportunity. Thank you so much to Mindy and Zionsville Parks and Recreation. Um, and I'm very thankful for those that are able to join us live today and for those that will be watching this down the road. Um, I'll take a moment to quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Mary Wells and I am with Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasives Management. And the theme of the talk today will be uh, landscape alternatives. So we're going to talk about invasive plants to avoid in landscaping um, because they are impacting um, our areas in, throughout the state, including Zionsville and Boone County, and then some native plants to choose instead. And there's a lot, so bear with me. <laughs> um, also, I just want to draw attention that it is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, there's two of them, interestingly, but this is the, the one that is more uh, about information and advocacy. So hosting this uh, webinar uh, is a good way to get the word out. Uh, again, I'm with Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasives Management. Um, we're a nonprofit coalition of organizations, agencies, governments, and citizen groups. Originally, the focus for SICKM, hence the name, is, was in Southern Indiana. Uh, at the end of 2017, uh, SICKM entered into a partnership with the National Resource Conservation Service to start my program that I work for, uh, the Indiana Invasives Initiative which is um, statewide, uh, so hence the name. So we are working to manage invasive plants and raise awareness throughout the state. Um, and we have the goal to start new SISMAs, and I'll define that weird acronym in a minute, throughout Indiana. Um, and actually, we have six regional specialists now and a project coordinator. Uh, this is the map of where we're at and who's covering what region. So we're out there, as you can see. Um, and that term SISMA, it's a little awkward. It, oops, sorry. It means Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. 
Uh, it's a partnership uh, organization formed with the goal of managing invasive species across types of land ownership. And it, the emphasis is local. Uh, and these, uh, this is just a map of SISMAs in Indiana. The counties that have them uh, are in blue. The ones that are in the process of organizing are in orange and then green has raised their hand, but um, we haven't gotten to the organizational point yet, which is where we're at in Boone County. So apologies to everyone if it's review. I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So a little bit of background to talk about native versus invasive species in terms of mostly plants. Uh, I, and we really love this definition that's in a book written by D um, Richard Dark and Douglas Hallamy. A, a native species is a plant or animal that has evolved in a given period of time or in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. It's a very open-ended statement because um, ecological communities are very open-ended. So it can be very local or very broad. Um, a native species um, could be an oak or one of our native moths, a native wildflower, a native bee, our birds, etc. On the other side of that coin is an invasive species. And um, to define an invasive species, we use the federal definition. First of all, it's non-native, uh, didn't evolve here. Uh, didn't build complex relationships with other organisms and its introduction causes or is likely to cause some type of harm. It's economic or environmental harm or harm to human, animal or plant health. It's usually a combination of those characteristics. So that's oriental bittersweet, the emerald ash borer. We have Asian carp issues and even feral pigs here in Indiana. There's a lot of negative impacts of invasive species and a lot of these um, areas kind of overlap, but it's kind of an underrealized threat. Invasive species um, are definitely a main risk to biodiversity in our natural areas, but they also impact um, our natural resources upon which everybody depends, humans, animals, et cetera. They can affect our military and first responder state of readiness. They can um, reduce our property values, um, you name it. But before we get into it, I want to just remind everyone that weedy or aggressive doesn't necessarily mean a plant is technically invasive um, by that federal definition. So uh, upper right, we have Virginia creeper, it's a native vine. It supports birds and insects. Um, birds enjoy the berries, insects eat the foliage. And then in the bottom, we have our native violet, common blue violet, which supports this funky looking caterpillar, um, which is a, one of the caterpillars of the fritillary butterflies. So without violets, we don't have fritillary butterflies because that's the only food that their caterpillars use to, to grow. Um, our pollinators, birds and other wildlife are at risk. Um, we're seeing invasive plants displacing um, native plants and then other wildlife. The monarch population declines. Uh, we're seeing 80% in the last 20 years. Um, it's not getting much better. And then uh, our North American bird populations are declining. There's a study showing 25% declines um, in a period of about 50 years. Um, birds. Most of our songbirds, um, while they can eat seeds, they rear their young on insect larvae and other uh, insects and arthropods. So without native plants, we don't have insects. Without insects, we don't have our beautiful songbirds. Invasive species uh, are spread a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of them are intentionally introduced. Um, so that landscaping component that we're talking about today, about 80% of our woody invasive, so that's trees, shrubs, and some of our vines, um, were actually escapes from our landscaping. They're spread by wildlife, um, they're, they're spread by um, accidentally in, in soil mixes and, and seed materials, um, even in crop arrangements. 
I've highlighted the ones here that we actually have a little bit more control over. So those are the areas we can start working on first to stop the spread. The, um, I'm excited to share a reminder about the rule that passed last year. As of April 18th, 2020, we have regulated 44 species um, and removed them from trade. Not all of those species are, were in the nursery industry, but a good amount were. And if you see a violation of this rule, which I'll talk about a little bit, you can report this to the regulatory agency through DNR, which is the Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. So there's a phone number and a website right there to reach your local nursery inspector. Um, of the 44, prohibited species, I'd say 20 to 21 were um, in the nursery trade, um, some of them not recently, but uh, these were all intentionally introduced for um, landscape or some sort of erosion control or other landscape service. And then we do have other regulated terrestrial plants in Indiana, and by terrestrial, I mean a plant that lives on land versus water. And um, I've highlighted this um, purple loose strife. Uh, we will talk about a little bit. So as gardeners, we need to be on the lookout because there are many invasive plants um, that were, are either regulated and accidentally sold, or there's some that aren't regulated but are invasive and are still in the landscape trade for various reasons. So even the most careful person can be fooled. Plants are sometimes mislabeled. Sometimes they have confusing or multiple names. Sometimes there's contaminants in our seed mixes uh, or soil materials. And sometimes if we're ordering online um, from out of state, those sellers are unregulated. So be careful. <laughs> um, uh, that's burning bush, which is still legal. And then um, winter creeper cultivar. Um, and I just want to highlight why we would have want to use native alternatives um, in, in our landscaping. They have desirable features that are comparable to um, the non-native plants that we're usually used to using. They have beautiful flowers. They can be great ground covers. They provide that fall and winter interest and in color. They provide the privacy and structure that we need. And then some of them even produce fruits and nuts that we can eat as well as the wildlife around us. Um, there are some alternatives um, that are non-invasive, but non-native, but I really wanna encourage everybody to take it to that level and consider using native plants instead because they provide the most benefit. Um, they support our local wildlife and um, natural resources. They're adapted to our region and if they escape, um, we don't have a catastrophe on our hands that we're dealing with for a lot of these invasive species. So I'm gonna talk about various different types of growth habits um, in relation to the common invasives that we see out there and then provide alternatives. Um, I won't spend too much time on um, any one plant, but if we wanna come back during the questions, feel free to ask. Um, so the one grass we're gonna talk about today is Chinese silver grass, also known as maidenhair grass, um, it's a clump forming tall ornamental grass, probably the most commonly used native grass in landscaping. Um, it has very white plumy um, seed heads and sometimes it'll have very gay foliage. <clears throat> and we are starting to see this escape. It was just recently re-ranked as a high level invasive. So it's not just staying in our landscapes, um, unfortunately. But fortunately, we have some very wonderful native grasses that do really well in landscapes, depending on your situation. The top three, I would say, are switchgrass in the bottom right, prairie drop seed, and little blue stem. They're the more well-behaved and adapt adaptable. We do have some taller grasses, big blue stem, Indian grass. Canada wild rye is a short-lived grass, but good for an area where you need something to colonize fast. We have some native sedges that do really well in wetter conditions. And then June grass is another na nice native. It's a more smaller clump forming grass. 
Moving on, we'll be talking about some invasive perennials that have showy flowers. Um, so we brought them in because they're pretty. This one is called Dame's Racket. Um, a lot of people see this in the woodlands because that's where it likes to be. And um, they don't actually realize it's not native. They think it's an, a native wildflower because it, well, one, it's just so beautiful. Um, and then we welcome it into our yards um, and it gets spread around. It has alternate um, lance shaped leaves with toothed edges. Um, that's to compare it to our native phlox, which has opposite leaves that are smooth. Um, it has showy flowers. One thing that's important is that the flower, flower petals are arranged in fours versus our, our phloxes that have flower petals in five. Um, it invades woodlands, woodland edges, open areas, tends to like soil, soil with a, a good moisture content and is spread prolifically by seed. And this one is regulated. So we're no longer allowed to spread this around to our friends and neighbors. So I'm um, hoping to see this become less common potentially. <laughs> Dame's Rocket alternatives. Um, I'm just kind of going through some of the ones that bloom around the same time or have a similar type of growth habit. Virginia bluebells are, are plants that do really well in kind of moist um, wooded areas for a landscape um, plant. You can't beat Blue Star. It's a really attractive plant and has wonderful fall color. Uh, Bradbury Monarda is a nice um, shorter stature bee balm. Uh, upper right, we have Goat's Beard. It has a similar type of habit and it's a taller plant. Uh, wild Hyacinth is a native hyacinth. Um, you can purchase bulbs online from reputable native plant sellers and um, it'll provide you a spring bloom. The blue false indigo is probably in my top five um, native plants for landscaping. Um, it gives you that early spring bloom and it's a very big, robust plant. Um, downy skull cap is another great one. Um, similar growing conditions to the Dame's Rocket. And then in the bottom right is that tall, one of our tall phlox, native phloxes. Um, we have several, but this is the one that does best in landscapes. Talking about that beautiful, but um, kind of crazy spreader, purple loosestrife. We do have some native loosestrifes, but purple loosestrife was introduced. Um, it's a wetland invader, um, has very showy flowers, which is why people tend to like it. Um, but each plant can produce a million seeds. So, and those seeds are very small and it's very hard to stop them from getting spread around. Uh, this is regulated um, outside of the terrestrial plant rule. Some purple loosestrife alternatives um, include cardinal flower and its relative great blue lobelia, the taller bee balm, which is wild bergamot, our New England aster is an excellent alternative, um, loves all of these plants like wetland conditions, our blazing stars, obedient plant, uh, calico beard tongue, we also have foxglove beard tongue, Smooth ironweed and um, one of my favorites, swamp milkweed for the monarchs. Uh, even more loose strife alternatives. Um, pickerel weed is more of a, likes that water edge. It needs to be, uh, have wet roots. Uh, if you want um, some spring flowers uh, in the wetland situation, the blue flag iris is a, is a must have. Um, Riddell's goldenrod and some other, the wetland goldenrods. Swamp rose mallow, a beautiful plant. Um, sneezeweed is one of my top five native landscaping plants. Um, really nice fall um, bloom time. Culver's root is gorgeous. Monkey flower in the middle bottom and then cup plant and wild senna. Wild senna is a pollinator magnet. Um, can you tell I'm really into perennials? Uh, I'll just keep going through these quickly. Um, wild geranium, these aren't necessarily for loose drive, but just great native landscape perennials. Um, wild columbine, Ohio spiderwort. Butterfly milkweed, again, for the monarchs. Lead plant in the upper right. Wood poppy in the lower left. Um, some of our black-eyed Susans, including showy black-eyed Susan, purple coneflower, and then 
aromatic aster in the bottom right is again in that top five for me as far as a native landscaping plant. It, mine bloomed up until November and beyond this year. Um, a few more. <laughs> Jacob's Ladder is a great one for wetland ground cover. Hairy beer tongue is good for part shade, dry conditions, as is knotted, nodding wild onion. Uh, wild petunia is another one that blooms all year round or all, all summer long. Um, yellow coneflower, landscape coreopsis. Smooth blue aster is another really landscape friendly aster. Uh, mountain mint, one of our native mints. Um, pale purple coneflower, rattlesnake master. I think I have one more slide, uh, bear with me. <laughs> uh, prairie sun drops is another really great landscape native. Wild quinine in the lower left. Compass plant and prairie dock are some really big, beautiful plants if you've got this space. Hori, Hori vervain is a really wonderful um, pollinator plant as is Joe pieweed. Um, the butterflies love it as well. The, if you want a really landscape friendly goldenrod, I highly recommend showy goldenrod. And then an easy to grow native for part shade to sun is fall sunflower. Whew, that was a lot. Um, so let's move on to invasive ground covers and vines. So we have in that picture there is periwinkle, sometimes known as vinca. It's a trailing evergreen perennial. It's not necessarily a vine. Um, it has dark shiny leaves that are kind of elliptic in shape, but they have a smooth edge. Uh, and then most notably, they have those um, lavender or light blue flowers in the spring. Uh, so it can take over an entire woodland. I've seen acres of this in uh, Brown County and um, Yellowwood State Forest near me. One that looks a lot like purple or vinca is the purple winter creeper. It also has those dark green evergreen leaves. Um, this one has um, teeth on the margins of the leaf. The stems tend to be a little thicker and this plant can climb, so it's a true vine. It produces flowers when it climbs, and those flowers form in berries, and this is how this one spreads. The birds will take those berries and spread them elsewhere. So that's the first focus if you ever want to control winter creeper is to stop it from climbing. And this one is regulated on the terrestrial plant rule. Another invasive ground cover um, introduced from Europe, English ivy. Um, it's also got very leathery evergreen leaves. It's a true vine. It also um, takes over the understory in shady areas typically. And it climbs and also produces fruit, which is then spread by wildlife. So now we get to talk about the native alternatives to these menace. Um, and I kind of broke them down by different types of growth habits. So we have our sedges, which are grass relatives. Um, gray's sedge in the left or left is a, does well in full sun as long as it has enough soil moisture as does porcupine sedge. The other ones can actually grow in shady conditions to full sun um, with fairly dry soil moisture or less soil moisture. So Eastern star sedge, white sedge, Seersucker sedge um, is a really good alternative if you're um, trying to find something besides hostas, which are not native. Um, and I sh I'm showing this picture of bristly sedge, um, not because it is native, it's, it's actually not very um, commonly found in Indiana, but I just love the, the use of the sedges in that native naturalized garden. So something to keep in mind, you can use white sedge or Eastern star sedge for a similar effect. Um, ferns make a great native ground cover um, and they provide a lot of texture and various architecture. Um, we have Christmas fern, lady fern, royal fern, our marginal wood fern, sensitive fern if you've got kind of a wetter situation, a maiden hair fern with that kind of fan shaped um, foliage, and then cinnamon fern, which is fun because it has uh, different fertile and infertile fronds. So it gives you a lot of interesting textures when, when it does produce those fertile fronds. 
Um, all of these are native. We do have other native ferns, but these are some of the ones that may be easier to find. And then we do have some wildflowers that make great native ground covers. Uh, dwarf crested iris is probably in my top five. And in terms of a, a shady native garden, um, it's just a very diminutive plant, blooms early. It's kind of a must have. The wild strong stone crop or is a native sedum. Uh, it's kind of a slow growing, creeping plant, succulent. The golden alexanders need a little bit of wet um, soil moisture, but they are a larval host for our black swallowtail butterflies. It's in the carrot family. So, uh, and early pollen and nectar sources. Um, to the right is wild ginger. It's a really wonderful um, native plant. It does bloom, but the flowers are usually underneath the leaves. So it's mostly that beautiful textured foliage that you're gonna want for your native landscaping. In the bottom left is golden ragwort. It's a hardy, hardy native plant. The leaves are evergreen pretty much all year. And then in the spring, it blooms profusely. Those beautiful yellow flowers. Um, blue mist flowers, another easy to grow native um, very short stature and um, also likes a little bit wetter situation. To talk a little bit more about the climbing vines that are really more climbing than ground cover, um, Japanese honeysuckle has been around for a while. It's very fragrant, um, climbs trees and shrubs and can kill them by girdling them, by wrapping around it. Um, the leaves are either simple and sometimes lobed, those flowers are white, fading to yellow, very fragrant, um, and does produce black fruits that are spread by birds. It tends to like more sunny situations, and um, but when it's when it's happy, it will really take over an entire area. And this is regulated on the terrestrial plant roll. Uh, Chinese wisteria is another um, native that can take over acres, believe it or not, um, and it's a very popular landscape plant. I showed a picture of the, the scary vine first, um, and then it has compound leaves. And when it does produce fruit, they're um, kind of fuzzy and flat. It's one way to tell it apart from our native wisteria, which has very round, um, smooth seed pods. And then the flowers, which is why people love them so much. Um, it's an image of the flowers. It does produce its flowers before it leaves out versus our native, which will leaf out. Um, and then produce flowers. Sweet autumn clematis is kind of an old fashioned popular landscape plant. We do have a native that looks a lot like this plant. Um, one way to tell it apart is the native has toothed leaves and is not fragrant, but otherwise they look very similar and have a similar growth habit. Oriental bittersweet is probably one of my least favorite native invasives. Um, we do have a native bittersweet and this one can hybridize with it. So we're losing an entire species just because of this plant. And it was primarily introduced um, because of craft arrangements and then the fruits were spread by wildlife. So it's kind of known as kudzu of the north. It can swallow trees, um, it has kind of Various shaped leaves, sometimes they're more oval, sometimes they're lance shaped. But when it produces its fruits, they're kind of all along the stem um, in a rope versus our native, which I'll show you a photo of that only produces fruits and clumps at the end of a, a stem. And this one is also regulated now. So these are some climbing vine alternatives. We have a lot of native vines. Some of them are a little aggressive. Um, I put cross vine up there, which has a similar flower, but is less aggressive to our trumpet creeper vine, which um, can be pretty aggressive. Uh, that's a photo of an American bittersweet, it has a smaller flower, um, and then, I'm sorry, American wisteria. And then below that is the American bittersweet. You can see the, the virgin's bower over on the right, um, bottom right, and then the coral honeysuckle. We'll try to go fast. <clears throat> um, so the most, says my internet connection is unstable. Is it okay? Is it going okay? 
I'm going to go on. You're doing all um, right. You're, you're, you're jumping a little bit, but it's not bad. Okay. Thanks. So Asian bush honeysuckle is probably the most common uh, shrub that you're going to see out there. And we have several species, um, but they generally have kind of arching branch structure, kind of, um, kind of striped bark um, that's unique to them. The flowers are generally white, sometimes pinkish. Um, so it's related to the Japanese honeysuckle. They have very similar flowers. When it does produce fruits, they're usually orange or red. Um, and it produces huge clumps. One thing that some people don't know is that there's been studies showing that certain species of birds, when they build their nest um, in a bush honeysuckle versus a native thicket, um, their nests have higher rates of nest predation. So the, the, the eggs or the young birds are eaten before they're able, able to become adults. And this is regulated, all, all of these species. Autumn olive is another very common one. You see this one a lot of, on roadsides. It was intentionally planted um, as an, you know, a windbreak, et cetera, natural hedgerow. Um, it has alternate leaf arrangement. One way to tell this one apart is it has silverly underneath portions of its leaves. Um, it blooms in the spring, very fragrant or early summer. And then even the fruits have a little bit of silvery um, hue to them. And this is regulated on the terrestrial plant roll. And one that is um, also regulated is called, is called Japanese barberry. It's very commonly used in landscapes. It's still in a lot of um, existing landscapes. And um, it has green or red foliage, depending on the genetics or the cultivar, um, produces fruits and it also has thorns and it's a pretty small shrub and then when it invades woodlands it, it forms these thickets. The thickets are a good home for the larval host of the black-legged tick which is um, a carrier of Lyme disease so if you have huge thickets of barberry your incidence of Lyme disease goes way up for an area and thank goodness it's regulated. <laughs> Privets. Um, privets have been around for a while and we have several species, but the one that's the most common is the blunt leaved privet, which I've depicted here, also known as border privet. And it produces black fruits, which are spread by birds. Um, and it does form very, very dense thickets. Also regulated. Um, last, but definitely not least, is winged burning bush. This one's uh, very common landscape plant, um, has that very distinctive red fall foliage. The stems are green and uh, the twigs are opposite and the leaves are opposite. And it has these quirky wings. So that's why it's called winged burning bush. And it does produce fruits that um, the birds and the other wildlife spread. And unfortunately, burning bush is still legal to sell in this state. So. Uh, just spreading the word and letting people know that uh, for whatever reason it, it was decided that even though it's a high ranked invasive, it's, um, it's still allowed to be sold. Some native shrub alternatives with showy flowers include smooth hydrangea, our swamp rose, and some of our other native roses. New Jersey tea, a really great smaller shrub for landscaping. Um, button bush, if you've got a wet area, it's got really fun um, round golf ball sized flowers. Indigo bush also likes kind of a wet situation. Um, we have a lot of native dogwoods like red osier dogwood. Nine bark is a really excellent uh, native shrub for landscaping. Um, and then we have um, one of our viburnums, black claw viburnum. Some that produce really showy fruit include choke cherry. American hazelnut actually has edible nuts. Um, elderberry, you can use the flowers or the fruits um, in elderberry wine or liqueur or syrup. Um, gray dogwood and rough leaf dogwood have really unique white fruits. Winterberry holly is a native deciduous holly. Um, spice bush um, also produces red fruits and then um, not as common to Indiana, but silky dogwood produces those really unique blue fruits. And then fall, you can't beat native shrubs for fall color. 
uh, fragrant sumac and black chokeberry make really great alternatives if you're looking for a replacement for burning bush. Same with arrowwood viburnum. The yellow uh, fall color of witch hazel is really amazing. Um, nannyberry viburnum is another one of our native viburnums. And then um, our, we have a few native sumacs, might be considered trees, small trees or large shrubs. And last, but unfortunately not least, is our invasive trees. We have, um, I guess, this, this tree makes me very sad because uh, it is still unfortunately legal uh, and it is a huge problem. It's still legal to sell by plant trade. Um, it's calorie pear, also known as a Bradford pear. It produces those white flowers in the spring. I think they smell terrible. I don't know how anyone else thinks about them. Um, and then they also produce these fruits. Um, the problem was it was initially brought in um, as a sterile cultivar. Um, they decided it had poor branching structure. So the landscape trade just, um, put out different cultivars. And because there was genetic diversity, they were able to cross pollinate and produce fruit. And the fruit is then spread by wildlife. Interestingly, it's typically spread by um, European starlings, which are invasive birds. So one invasive species is getting spread by another. Um, just real quick on calorie pear. Um, it's all over our woodlands. It's all over our roadsides. Um, you really can't have a fallow field in parts of Indiana. Um, without having it getting taken over by calorie pale pear. So you'd have to mow that to keep it from becoming all pear. Another last tree that we'll go through is Norway maple. Um, it's a very common landscape tree, um, has very textured uniform bark. It looks a lot like our sugar maples. Um, the leaves are very similar. The best way to tell it apart is the bark, the seeds, and even the, um, the leaf, the buds, the leaf buds. Um, our native um, seeds are more U-shaped or upside down U-shaped, and the Norway maple has a, nor a kind of a coat hanger shaped seed. Um, there's also a kind of a, a milky sap when you take the leaf off, this, off of this twig. If you squeeze the leaf stem, you'll get like a milky sap. Our native sugar maple has a clear sap. The problem is these are actually taking up the same space that a sugar maple would in our woodlands. So instead of sugar maple, Norway maple are moving in. So we have a lot of native trees, um, over 100. Um, so I'm just kind of emphasizing some of the trees that are smaller, are bloom, produce flowers, or have really great fall color. So downy service berry is great. We also have um, smooth service berry. In the bottom left, one of my favorite native trees is black gum, really beautiful fall color. It does produce flowers that are, um, are pollinated by insects. Uh, we have two dogwoods here. So we have pagoda dogwood, which has really wonderful lateral branching, and then the flowering dogwood as well, which everybody loves. We have a lot of native hawthorns, including green hawthorn, beautiful, um, beautiful um, flowers in the spring. The hop horn bean is a really a small, kind of a small tree that um, is actually a really nice landscape plant. Eastern red bud, you can't beat that. Um, it's kind of it's one of my, I guess I'd say it's one of my top five. American plum uh, is kind of a, kind of a small tree or a, a large, a small tree or a large shrub, kind of thicket forming. And Ohio buckeye is, um, personal favorite of mine, but my family's from Ohio. So maybe that's why. So real quick, I'll go through a few other ways to get involved and leave time for questions. Um, you've learned a little bit about native plants. Um, I recommend learning more. The Indiana Native Plant Society has a lot of resources on their website. Um, there's also a few books up here, um, two of them by Douglas Talamy, who is a, um, entomologist that has done a lot of research on native plant and insect relationships. Um, then this book by Heather Holmes called Pollinators of Native Plant Plants, and then a book by the Xerces Society, Attracting Native Pollinators. Plant Native, so Indiana Native Plant Society has their Grow Indiana Natives program. You can find 
places to buy native plants that are reputable throughout the state and close to nearby to Indiana. And you can also certify your property to let your friends and neighbors know that you plant native and why. Um, if you find invasive plants on your property, get rid of them. You can remove them mechanically, um, but sometimes in certain situations, herbicide is may, may be needed. So for plants that have perennial root systems or plants that are covering a lot of ground, um, one thing to keep in mind is that you don't really wanna compost some native or invasive plant material. Um, if it, especially if it has seeds or if those vines are um, continue growing um, and move things off site, if so, to make sure they don't keep growing. Some handy tools to use to get rid of um, native or invasive plants and protect yourself. Um, there's some great resources for Indiana specific invasive plants. Um, the Indiana Invasive Species Council website has a lot of resources and they've recently released a guide that you can download a PDF for free um, that lists um, the regulated invasive plants in Indiana and um, how to identify them and if they have any native lookalikes. And then the website for my organization, SICKM, has a lot of information uh, on our website as well as on social media. You can request direct assistance through my program and other uh, programs from our partners. So if you want um, in-person or over the phone technical assistance, um, you'll have my contact information. And uh, volunteer at a weed wrangle in your area. So keep an eye out um, if you're in Zinesville or elsewhere throughout the state, um, there's gonna be opportunities for you to get out and control invasives on public lands. And spread the word. Uh, I love this billboard that they did down in Du Bois County. Um, and I also kind of get a kick out of the hammer um, being into getting rid of your burning bush as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I just wanted to see if we, looks like we have some time for questions. And then um, also I have a few slides to go through if you'd like me to go ahead and do that now, Mindy. Yeah, go ahead and flip through them for okay. me. All right. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Um, just really quick, and then we'll open up for questions. I know there's a couple that want to answer. There's a few more that have popped through. Um, but yeah, so invasive species and Zionsville Parks. Um, I've been with the Zionsville Parks and Recre Recreation Department for seven years now. And so I know that we, we take a lot of pride in the parks that we do have. So currently in Zionsville, we have about 500 acres of parkland. Majority of that parkland, unlike other parks and rec departments um, in the state, is natural. Um, that's one unique thing with our Zionsville parks is that majority of our parkland is natural parks that we have preserved and we maintain that one. Um, a great example of that one is our 75 acre Starkey Nature Park. Um, so we take pride in our ownership, but just because they're natural habitats doesn't mean that they don't require a lot of work and a lot of maintenance. While we're not out there mowing everything with a lawnmower, it still takes quite a lot of effort. Um, so you've probably seen, if you live in Zionsville over the years, you've probably seen some work that we've had done. Um, if you're newer to the area, if you have went out, these pictures are actually from this fall and winter. So we did some restoration work along the Big Four Rail Trail. So that's where the tractor is there that for the majority of the rail trail, we actually had, uh, we worked closely with a company called Ecologic out of Bloomington. And they came out, they actually spent two weeks, it took them two weeks <laughs> to go down the rail trail and they removed as many invasive woody shrubs all the way to, if you've been on the rail trail, there are ditches on either side because it was a railroad. Um, and then they had to have ditches to remove that water. So from ditch to ditch, they removed anything that they found that was invasive. Um, so we're talking that they've uh, cut multiflora rose, calorie pear, uh, bittersweet, both we've had both bush and vine honeysuckle as well as autumn olive. Um, and they will go back. They did also, Mary talked about stump treat. 
So they did go through and stump treat and they will go back again this spring and, and pick up any that might have re-sprouted and do a fuller application. So where they spray that very quickly. Um, and then the other picture that you see is a pond that we have called Carter Station Pond, which what you don't, I should have took it before because um, you could barely see the pond um, that had filled in completely with honeysuckle and other invasives. This unfortunately was a park that we didn't take very good restoration work on. So it had been neglected. Um, but you know, when I started seven years ago, you could see the pond. So that's how quickly invasives can take hold of something that if you're not really monitoring and watching, it can really take hold of it. Um, so we work really hard at making sure that we, you know, maintain the, the restored prairies that we do have, as well as um, the floodplain through like Starkey Park and a lot of our other parks, as well as our native forests that we have and our wetlands that we have as well. You wanna flip to the next one for me? I only have two slides. There we go. <laughs> So while we do within our budget, um, the Zionsville Parks and Recreation, we spend a good amount of money every year in both invasive species work as well as in restoration projects. Um, so that's one thing that we try to maintain because it's a lot easier just to maintain versus trying to completely restore over. We're actually branching out and looking at ways that we can get the community to help more. Um, it's something that the community has always asked, what can they do? Uh, we started with what we call our pull for parks, uh, and we will be doing those again this year, um, and those will be weed wrangles, um, so we'll make sure that Mary puts them on the website. We'll also have them on our website for the town, so if you're interested in those, you can reach out to me. I'm hoping to have those dates listed here very soon on the town's website. And we're going to have a whole volunteer page, uh, but we're also looking at other ways that we might be able to get the community to help us maintaining our parkland. Um, so we will be working out some trail work days and kind of my favorite to add for this fall is we will have some honeysuckle removal days um, that will pick areas in our parks that we need some help to get in there. And uh, so if you, uh, you know, Maybe you don't have any invasives around your house, but you really want to take advantage of getting rid of some invasives. Um, you can come help us and make you feel good about, you know, cutting out honeysuckle. Um, you won't get to play with the pesticide, the herbicides. We'll do that part, but give you a chance to kind of work in there. So, um, so yeah, so kind of keep a lookout. We will make sure that we post when those community service days are up for pull for parks and then how you can get involved in that one. So, but we will um, flip it over and we'll take any questions that anybody has on the last few minutes of our presentation here. So let's see. So we had, so yeah, Dave, I hope you use it for, uh, for garlic mustard. You know, it's the garlic mustard is a prolific one, but it's an easy one to get rid of. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it just, it means a lot of work. Uh, the downside here in Zionsville is that because majority of our parks are on a floodplain, even though if we do really well at getting rid of garlic mustard in our parks, um, when it does flood, that seed tends to uh, work its way downstream and end up back in our parks again. So, you know, so we keep at it, but we got to make sure all of our, our neighbors, you know, upstream of us need to start working on things too. Um, but you also did ask, um, you know, have we banned anything? We haven't. Um, that's not something that that would have to come through a, a policy through the town itself. And while they, they, you know, we're working on our climate action plan, I haven't heard anything about the town taking a precedent on trying to ban certain species. Um, it's really something that needs to come through the state. And I know they're working at trying to get more plants on, on that um, kind of that list. So we'll just kind of help them along as however we can on that one. Um, but then I did have another question that popped up and Mary, maybe you can answer this one because um, I'm not quite sure what might be the best one. So Jennifer wants to know, she has a privet shrub in her property. So she'd like to get rid of it. Um, but she needs something that's big and fast growing for privacy. She's got south facing full sun. So what do you think? What would be your top one that you would jump out for? You know, 
if you if you want it to be a similar shape as a privet, I would say arrowwood viburnum um, is a great choice. Um, some of our native dogwood shrubs, like rough leaf dogwood or gray dogwood, um, would also be a really great option, and they're both fast growing. Um, full sun would work for both of those, but um, the other one, rough leaf, is probably going to be happier um, in regular soil moisture. So if you had a wet situation, the the gray dog would be more ideal. <clears throat> um, you know, if it can be big and it could be a tree, it could be Eastern red cedar, but um, that's a 50 foot tree <laughs> if you need privacy. Um, that's my two cents. What do you think, Lindy? I got it with it. Uh, yeah, some of the viburnums. So uh, would be a nice one. Yeah, if you're trying to get something a little bit larger, looking at some of the, the trees, um, just because they'll also provide some shade if that's another thing you're going for for south facing full sun. So like a service berry or, you know, I have a, a red bud in my yard. So yeah, I'm kind of partial to them as well. <laughs> and, I, and they do pretty good. They grow pretty fast. So I would also say witch hazel um, and hazelnut because they're big shrubs. Um, they take up a lot of room and they have really attractive foliage. Um, they don't have, um, there's nothing showy about their flowers um, and unless you, they're subtle, but I, they're still really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And I'll just, uh, my excuse for not mentioning garlic mustard is it's not typically used in landscaping. Um, though it is, was brought in as a, a culinary herb by German settlers. So that's why it's here, because you can eat it, um, but it's not a typical landscape plant. That's right, you can make a really good pesto, so but just make sure you know where you harvested it from before you start making pesto. Oh, we got some more questions here. Nope, oh, just a big thank you from Jennifer. So. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, if you're interested in um, getting a little more one-on-one -on -one information, um, I can put my contact information back up whatever works for. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. And for those again, like I said, this is gonna be, this is this is video or recorded. So I will send this out to you if you wanted to go back through because um, Mary gave so many different alternatives for you to look at. So as you're planning out your garden, because you know, we're getting into spring here, you can kind of look through those. Uh, but if you have any questions, you're, you're always welcome to reach out to me and I'm happy to share information for anybody. Um, and then also, yeah, make sure you kind of keep a watch. If you don't already follow the, the Zionsville Parks and Recreation on Facebook, we have a new Facebook page, or you can follow Zionsville Nature Center where you probably found this one, um, or just watch the Town of Zionsville's website. So we will be posting volunteer information on there soon. And that will also include our community service information. Um, so we're trying to set up some weed wrangles for garlic mustard in the spring, and then we'll hit honeysuckle in the fall. And we'll look at what we can hit in between from then. So, but, um, but yeah, everyone have a great evening and thank you so much for participating. Thank you, everybody.